All right, we're going to be starting in 2 Kings, 2 Kings uh, chapter 2, so if you have your Bible or your tablet, we're going to 2 Kings chapter 2, it is an honor and a privilege to be here tonight, and any opportunity that I can speak the word, I don't take that lightly, so glad to see all of you, and see your faces, <coughs> this is just I love it. I love it. Also, like to welcome everybody online through Facebook, YouTube. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, if you're tuning in for the first time, I encourage you to grab your Bible, your tablet, a pen, and paper. Jot down the Bible verses so that you can search these things out in your own time to verify whether or not these things are true in the scriptures. And so, I'm in 2 Kings chapter 2. I'm going to jump into verse 23. And verse 22, we'll start there. So, the waters were healed unto this day according to the saying of Elijah, which he spake. And he, Elijah, went up thence unto Bethel, and as he was going up thy way, there came forth little children out of the city, and mocked him, and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. And he turned back, and he looked on them, and he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And there came forth... Two she-bears out of the woods, and tear forty and two children of them. Mm -hmm. And he, Elijah, went from thence to Mount Carmel, and from thence he returned to Samaria. So what did we just read? Well, we are in Second Kings. The prophet Elijah was walking on his way, and some ewes came out and started mocking him, calling him a bald ape. And then he cursed them in the name of the Lord, and then two... Bears came out and mauled those 42 children. Lesson learned from the scripture. Don't call the man of God bald. <laughs> Is it Elijah or Elisha? It's Elisha with the S-H-A. Oh. That's just, I'm just kidding. That's just a joke. Yeah, it's time to go. I lost the hair. Let's get it all out. All right. So tonight I want to talk to you about the fundamentals of understanding your Bible. So, if you will, we're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, so go there, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I have, uh, in my personal studies, been going through the book of Psalms, all 150 of them, tooth and combing, going through all of them, and then I, and now I'm in the book of Proverbs, and I'm kind of tooth and combing them, and man, it's just been such a great study and it's been absolutely uh, eye-opening when I look at the Bible and when I study it to understand, you know, us living in the age of grace, what it was like for uh, interacting with God in times past under the law and how you had to go through that nation, Israel. And I got to thinking about this study that I want to do tonight, the fundamental, fundamentals of understanding your Bible, because if you don't understand your Bible... And you start reading this thing, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. You can hurt yourself. You can pierce your own self. You can shipwreck your own faith. And I'm speaking all of these things from personal experience. Without a guide, not knowing the scriptures and being ignorant of rightly divine the word of truth, I got myself into a lot of problems. I used to read all of the scriptures as if they were all written directly to me. So that when I was in reading in things in the book of Psalms and the book of Kings and, 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 uh, and Ezekiel, I would try and do those things that those prophets were told to do by the Lord. And I found a problem. Because when I tried to do those things that the Lord told those prophets to do, when I would speak the words, it wouldn't happen. So it got me thinking, huh, I've got a lot to learn. So that's what this message of tonight, I want to focus on four things uh, that I want to touch about the fundamentals of understanding your Bible. I want to talk about the natural man versus the spiritual. Then I want to talk to you about wisdom and understanding. The third thing, we'll talk about the simplicity in Christ. And then the fourth thing, I'm going to give you the key for unlocking the scriptures so that when you're doing your own personal studies, it's nothing but just a complete joy to know 
who you are in Christ, where you're at in the scriptures, what's being said, who are they speaking to, and how does this impact your daily walk with the Lord? So we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to talk about the natural versus the spiritual man. And this is probably the most important part for actually understanding your Bible. Because if you don't get this first thing right, you're never going to understand the book. So we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. What did I want to tell you? 2 Corinthians. Corinthians chapter 2. No. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I apologize. No. You need first Corinthians. I need first two. Corinthians chapter two. Let's go to first Corinthians. I I just about to done the wrong thing. And in first Corinthians uh, chapter two, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth. Uh, this was a synagogue uh, of the Jews, but Gentiles that were attached hard to this synagogue. So there were Jews and Gentiles at, at Corinth. And in second, uh, First Corinthians chapter two, we jump to verse one. And I, Paul, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined to not know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words or man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that came come to naught. But we... Speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given unto us, uh, given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So, Paul is explaining to the Corinthians, look, I didn't come to you speaking philosophical principles. I didn't come teaching uh, principles. He came speaking the words of the Lord. And he was, he was quoting scripture here from the Old Testament, and he starts comparing the things of, of God versus the world. And he's explaining to the Corinthians, they had received the gospel of Christ, they believed and trusted that Christ died for their sins on the cross at Calvary, that he was buried, and that he was resurrected the third day. So they had received by that belief and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. They received the Spirit of God. They were sealed unto the day of redemption. And so now they have the, wisdom, they have the Spirit of God inside them. So now they can actually comprehend and understand the Scriptures. Because he tells you in verses... Verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Meaning that if you're not saved, if you have not trusted in Christ, death, burial, resurrection for your sins, you do not have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. God is not dwelling in buildings today. He's dwelling in the believer. 
those Amen. that have believed and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation, that they are saved by grace through faith and that not of themselves. It is the gift of God, period, by grace. Not because you got water baptized, not because you confessed your sins, not because you bowed down at an altar, not because you sold everything you had and gave to the poor, not because you cut off your right hand or gouged out your left eyeball, which a lot of people, they don't really do and live out those things that Jesus said, but there are very few that have done that in this dispensation of grace, and my, what a tragedy that is. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that if you haven't simply believed the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of Christ, the power of God unto salvation, you do not have the Spirit of God inside you, you're not going to understand this book. Amen. Amen. Period. Amen. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. When was that moment in your life when you came to a place where you realized that when you drew your last breath, when you were ready to die, when, when the Lord says it's your time up on this earth, where are you going from that moment on? There's only two places. There's heaven, there's hell. Those that trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's heaven. Those that reject Christ dying for their sins at Calvary, being buried and rose again the third day, it's hell. Now that's some very heavy, no heavy matter how good you words. Are. Doesn't matter. It's not based upon your merit. It's not because you live a good life. It's not because you are righteous in your own ways. Guess what? You read the scriptures, you dig into the Bible... Your righteousness are filthy rags in the sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole entire reason that the Lord sent His Son down here to die a tragic death, being nailed to a cross, crucified, naked, for six hours, that's what it costs to pay for your sins. There's forgiveness in His blood. It's God shedding His own blood at the cross of Calvary that God has forgiven you and wiped clean Every single sin. Amen. God abolished the law and commandments in His Son, Jesus Christ, at the cross at Calvary. Yes, there is a law. It was to be a teacher. It was to point us towards Christ. Christ fulfilled that law. No man could fulfill it. That's why it's so important that you get this first thing right. When was that moment when you just trusted in Christ? You trust in Christ? You got the Spirit of God in you? All right, now we can move on to the next step of the fundamentals of understanding your Bible, and that's getting wisdom. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. It's amazing. I love the book of Proverbs. I'm going through it. There's 31 chapters in it. It's a great book. It's a great discipline that if you haven't done this before, I encourage you to. It's a great study. You got the days of the month? Just read the chapter with correlation with the day. It's a really good study. And man, I'm telling you, it's all about wisdom. Uh, God wrote this book through the second wisest man to walk this earth, King Solomon. The one that took over Israel at the age of 11. He's the one that had that prayer and that dream and asked, Lord, just give me wisdom and give me discernment how to lead these people. Because David was giving the reins over to his son. And he was young and he had to lead a whole entire nation. Think about that. 11-year-old leading a nation. And so he asked for wisdom. He asked for discernment. God was pleased with him. And God blessed him with so much wisdom and discernment and wrote these uh, uh, 31 chapters jam-packed with, uh, with gold nuggets in it. And in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. And you can read through all of Proverbs and you see this pattern and it's, 
It's this father instructing his son. Get instruction. Incline thy ear to wisdom. Seek wisdom. It's all about growing and knowing. And, and what, what is wisdom? Wisdom is just knowing what's right from what's wrong. That's really what we, you boil it down to. That's, that's what, what it means to be wise. You know what's right. You know what's wrong. Jump to Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Going on the scene, get wisdom, get understanding. How do you get wisdom? How do you get understanding? Look where it says in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So in order for you to get wisdom, to start, I, I, I'm, I'm a very simple person, I need like, I need an instruction manual. Tell me step Amen. one, step two, step three. I'm good. Amen. All right, well, if I need to get wisdom, then the step one is I need to have the fear of the Lord. Okay, then my next question is, what is the fear of the Lord? Well, just look what it, the Bible tells you right there in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, and then it's going to explain what evil is, pride, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the for forward mouth do I hate. So you want to know what the fear of the Lord is? It's to hate evil. It's to despise pride. It's to stay away from arrogancy, avoid it, avoid the evil way, and the forward mouth. What does forward mean? Obstinate. What's forward mean, Obed? It's a uh, uh, solvent, the slovent use of the words. Uh, it's a good word to study, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Grab up a Noah's Dictionary, 1828. Type in forward. Look at that definition. This is what all instruction is all about. This is what seeking knowledge is all about. You come across a word in your Bible, you don't know what it means, you start seeking it out. You grow in wisdom and knowledge and understanding, and that's what God's desire is for the walk of the believer today. He wants all men to be saved, number one, what we talked about, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. How do you come unto the knowledge of the truth? You get it by wisdom, by getting understanding, by studying the scriptures, by understanding words and the meaning and the, the impact and the instruction from the word to give now your soul, your spiritual man, direction in everyday life. Turn to Proverbs 8, no, I did 8.13. Now, Get wisdom, get understanding. Let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Paul writes, now this is Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, speaking to his own son in the faith, Timothy. He tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, consider what Peter says. Consider no. what John says. No. Consider I... what James says. No. no, it says, consider what I say. Paul, that's Paul there. Consider what I, Paul, say. And the Lord give thee understanding in some things. No. Oh. The Lord... What's it say? Shall give the understanding in all things. So what have we talked about so far? We talked about the natural man and the spiritual man. The natural man, the unsaved man, not going to understand the scriptures. The saved man, he's going to have the spirit of God in him. He can actually read the Bible and understand what's being said. And then we were talking about getting wisdom and getting understanding. How do we get wisdom? Well, we got to read. we got to study. we got to grow. we got to fear the Lord. we got to hate our pride. we got to swallow our pride. I'll tell you what. In my early walk, in the first eight years of my life, I and my walk as a believer, 
I was freaking prideful. I was so arrogant, and I was so ignorant of the word, it was unbelievable. I had this mentality as a babe in Christ that, oh, I'm a believer, I believe in Jesus, I'm good with God, I don't need to read the Bible, I'm cool, I can do whatever I want to do, I'm saved by grace. That was my mentality. And it wasn't until I started dabbling in things, spiritual things, things that I was starting to discern something's off, and I met my wife who challenged me on my beliefs and challenged me in the Word, challenged me in 1 Corinthians 13 about the gifts, challenged me in rightly dividing the Word of Truth. She gave me, she gave me a pamphlet, and this is a dumbed-down version of it, but she gave me a pamphlet of the timeline and said, here, check this thing out. And I was going tooth and comb through that timeline, trying to prove it wrong. So I was like, oh, there's no way. There's no way this is right. And after wrestling with it for four weeks, I came to a place where I tooth and combed every single Bible scripture, and it was there in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And guess what happened? The Word was shining a light in my life. It was finally shining a light in my heart and in my mind and in my soul, realizing, one, I have been wrong. And two, I saw the grace of God. Amen. I saw the truth of the gospel. I saw the simplicity in Christ. And I came to a point in my life where I realized, oh my God, I can't do anything for my salvation. I can't check off the box of everything that it means to be a Christian, live a righteous life, Try and do everything according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which a lot of Christianity is stuck in those four books. They never get to the book of Acts to read what happens afterwards. And when I came to that place, I realized I had been subtly... Well, let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul talking to the Corinthians. It's the second letter that he wrote to them. And he's telling them in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 and 4, Paul writes, and now, now keep in mind, Paul loved the Corinthians. I mean, he, he loved them as if they were his own children. Like, he, you can read in the scriptures, he, he literally was like a father unto them. And, and so keep that in mind for you fathers that have children. Look at what he's writing to his own children. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent, who's the serpent? Satan. The devil, Satan. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh, if, for if he that cometh and preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you have received another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear, bear you might well bear with him. So the Corinthians, they had these preachers coming into their midst, and they were coming to them in the name of Jesus. They're preaching and teaching spiritual things, but they're doing it by another spirit, and the gospel that they're preaching was not the gospel that Paul had preached to the Corinthians that had established them in the gospel of Christ. Amen. They were preaching another gospel. And here's how you know if it's another gospel. It's so subtle. These guys can come in, these false preachers, these false teachers can come in and say, Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. But you've got to do this or you've got to do that. And they try to add one little tiny work in there, injected in their gospel. If you want to be saved, you've got to be water baptized. If you want to be saved, you're going to have to do X, Y, Z. Period. That's how subtle it is. 
That's how Satan works. You go back and you read in the garden how the enemy worked amongst Adam and Eve. What did he do? Well, you could see the, the serpent tempting Eve. You can see adding to God's word, subtracting from God's word, taking away, watering it down, and then just ultimately denying it. That's how the enemy works. And if you think about enemies, and you think about tactical warfare, one of the first things that an enemy, if, you, if you're going into warfare, one of the first things that opposing forces will try to do, what do they do? They try to knock out communication. If you can cut off the lines of communication, the enemy cannot work together to maneuver and pivot and get against that enemy. Same thing applies within our spiritual walk. If the devil can take this out of your walk, you now have lost your lines of communication with the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because every single word in this Bible is the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to understand it, the key to understanding it is rightly dividing the word of truth. This is how you do it. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. The rate at which this present evil world is going is we're going down a path of Bible literacy. We're going down a path where people do not understand their Bible. They don't have a depth or knowledge in the Scriptures, and they're consuming anything and everything from anybody that proclaims to be a Christian or godly. And that can be very dangerous ground. And I'm not just talking within... Christianity. I'm talking about Eastern religion, Western religion, all of it. Religion at its core is if you do this, then you get that. Faith is I believe, therefore I have spoken. And that's what our, our faith is ultimately boiled down to. That's what's still in motion. That's what started back all the way. From the garden till now. The word of God has been standing through all the times. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15, this is the key to unlocking your Bible to understanding your scriptures. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So I want to unpack a few things here. One, you have to study. Study you got to do the work. you got to do the time. you got to actually be intentional with the time that you have on this earth to actually open up this book, get your nose in it, and read it line by line. Here a little, there a little. I don't care where you're at. Just get in there. So first thing is study. And then who are you studying to show yourself approved unto? Men? No. God. This is mano y mano. This is between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not pretending or hiding anything from the Lord. I mean, it's completely you and the Lord. You're studying to show yourself approved unto God because one day, every single one of us is going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, before God the Father. Whether it's at the great white throne or whether it's at the judgment seat of Christ, we will all stand before that judgment seat. And so you're starting to show yourself approved unto God. A workman. What's a workman? A man that does work. That he is not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. When I look at the first nine years of my walk with the Lord, I gotta tell you, I was pride, prideful, I was arrogant. Guess what? I still think I am prideful and arrogant, so still got to deal with that in my flesh. But the thing was, was when I started talking about spiritual things, I started talking about the great catching up of the church, the body of Christ, I started talking about the deep things of God, I wasn't able to actually back it up with the scriptures. And guess what happened? I naturally was ashamed. So the word of God kept piercing my heart, and I finally got to the point where it's like, that's it? 
I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I actually want to understand this book for myself. And when I, when I came to that point and I started diving into the Word of God and unpacking rightly divine the Word of Truth, I, I'll never forget. I was reading all the articles that Google had to say about rightly dividing the Word of Truth. And man, it was not hard to see that every single article on Google had nothing but to blast this thing. And so I was reading every single article. I was reading what all these commenters had to say about it. And guess what I was doing? I was reading the comments, but guess what else I was doing? I was reading my Bible. And I was examining what are they saying versus what is the Scripture saying. And then I just kept digging into the Scriptures. And I kept digging more. Here a little, there a little. And I started proving things for my own self. And then there came to the point where I was no longer ashamed to stand before God. But I had this excitement and this passion. And I'm like, man, i got to tell everybody about this thing. It's incredible. I actually understand the Bible. I understand the 66 books of the Bible. I understand that 53 of them are written and addressed to Israel. It literally will tell you, speak these words unto the children of Israel. The 12 tribes, an actual nation here on earth. And then I start reading these things. And I get to Acts, and I start seeing this transition. Because up until this point, it's just a nation, Israel. Gosh, you watch this show right now. I can't remember the name of it. It's, it's uh, The Chosen. I mean, you watch that thing. It is it's powerful. It's really cool to actually look and see Jesus Christ in the flesh and to think things, and it's stretching you. But you got to get past that books and see what happens in Acts because it literally tells you, you. You watch The Chosen. It's no secret. I'm looking at Jewish men and Jewish land, and Jesus is a Jew, and he's speaking to Jewish people. That's it. It's one nation. It's not the whole world. And then I get to Acts. Look at Acts 10, verse 36. Acts 10, verse 36. Now, in Acts 10, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is Cornelius. Cornelius, he was a Gentile, but he was a unique Gentile. He was... Uh, a devout man, one that feared the God of Israel, and uh, he gave much alms to the Jewish people because he knew that they were God's chosen people for the earth. And when Peter is called to come and speak and preach on them, look what it says in verse 36. The word which God sent unto who? The, the children of Israel. Everything up and from, from every single word in your Bible up until this point is just God speaking to the children of Israel. And then you go two more chapters. Go two more chapters. There's a switch that happens. In Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 9, this man, Saul of Tarsus, gets saved. His name is later changed to Paul in, this, in, in Acts chapter 13. He is the only apostle of the Gentiles in your holy scriptures. If, you, if, if you're new to the Bible, you got two groups of people in your Bible. you got the nation of Israel, that chosen people, that called out nation... Amongst the world, and then you got Gentiles. Gentiles are all the other nations surrounding Israel. Okay? They were not God's chosen people. Israel was. And in, in Acts chapter 13, verse 46, it says, Then Paul and Barnabas, let, hold on, let me back up. So what happens, this chapter, Paul goes into a synagogue of the Jews. They're reading the law of Moses. And then they're like, hey, men and brethren, do you have anything to say? And so then Paul stands up, and he stands before all of his brethren, and he starts proclaiming all the things of God from Abraham all the way up into Jesus. And talking about how the law of Moses, you can now be justified by this man, Jesus Christ, apart from the law of Moses. And they just freak out. They lose their mind. And in Acts chapter 13, verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas wax bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. He's talking to Israel. But seeing ye put it from you, 
and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. They were rejecting that Christ's death, burial, resurrection on the cross was enough for them to be justified before God. They rejected that. So, judging yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to who? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. This is the first time you see in your scriptures and the Holy Bible, all from the beginning of Genesis till now, where you see God shift the sights and is actually taking his word, God's word, outside of the nation of Israel. Three times it happens during the book of Acts. And you get to Acts 28, verse 28, the very end of the book. Look what it says. This is the final and third time. Verse tw Acts 28, verse 28. The very end of this book. It says, Be it known unto you, He's talking to Israel here, that the salvation of God is sent unto who? Gentiles. The Gentiles. And that they will hear it. And that was it. That was some 2,000 years ago. And ever since then, there's been a pause in God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel. Because what was supposed to happen next was the wrath of God was supposed to come. The, the times of troubles with Jacob was supposed to, That 70th week of Daniel. All those things were supposed to happen. But it didn't happen. What happened? God saved one man named Paul. He was a Roman and a Jew in one body. God gave unto that man the revelation of the mystery of Christ, how that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, that he's buried and rose again the third day according to scriptures, and that Christ not only died for that nation of Israel, but Christ died for his enemies, the ones that were trying to blot out Israel. They hated Israel. It was all the Gentile nations surrounding. And you just look at the history of Israel, the Gentiles have always been trying to wipe out that nation of Israel. They're still trying to wipe out the nation of Israel today. There's speak. a whole entire lesson in geopolitics, and you get it straight from the Bible. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. There's a fundamental truth of rightly dividing the word truth. This is it. You're rightly dividing God's word between the truth of God's word that he spoke to the nation of Israel from the truth of God's word that he spoke to all the Gentiles. And you just rightly divide <laughs> Romans through Philemon. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. He wrote 13 books. How do we know he wrote 13 books? Just read the first word of Romans through Philemon. Guess what that first word's going to be? Paul, 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 Paul. God made this so simple and so easy for you to see that those that have eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand, this is simple. And in order for you to fully understand, you've got to have the spirit of God in you first. Number two, you got to fear the Lord. You got to hate pride. You got to hate arrogancy. You got to hate the evil way and the froward mouth. Examine yourself. Get in the scriptures. Start studying and comparing spiritual things, the spiritual words that God spoke to Israel, the church, the body of Christ, which is Jew and Gentile, by the way. Doesn't matter, God has no respect of persons today. That's not how he dealt here in the Old Testament. He had respect for the nation of Israel. That's how you rightly divide the word of truth. Now, some of us all have backgrounds, we all have stories, we all were taught things spiritually. And I, for the first nine years of my life, consumed everything that I thought was, oh, Christian, Jesus, oh, consume. You gotta be careful what you eat. Amen. You gotta be extremely careful what you eat. You're either drinking the milk of God's word, you're either eating the meat of God's word, or you're eating the garbage junk food of words of men and religion. Amen. And the only way you're gonna be able to examine all this thing is through the scriptures. So what did we talk about tonight? We talked about the fundamentals of understanding your Bible. The natural man does not receive these things, cannot understand this book. We talked about getting wisdom and getting understanding, and that first starts with the fear of the Lord. 
We talked about the simplicity in Christ. It's so simple when you just examine the, the, the Bible and look at the scriptures on the pages of, of the book. And we talked about the key to unlocking the scriptures is rightly dividing the word of truth. When you start rightly dividing the word of truth, you're going to have complete clarity, zero confusion when it comes to the scriptures. God is not the author of confusion. The enemy is. He wants this thing out of your hands. He wants this thing closed. Because if it's closed, and you have no light of the word in your life, well then he's just able to have a day. And the, the work of the ministry is not going to be effective because men of God are not, faithful men of God are not taking this thing, studying it, speaking it. Faithful men and women of God are not able to do that. That's why it's so important that we study to show ourselves approved unto God. Workmen and women that do not need to be ashamed. Right, we find word truth. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this time and the opportunity to open up your word and to search your scriptures. We thank you for everyone here and for those who are online tuning in. God, I just pray uh, that you, this word would be encouraging, that it would be challenging, that it would be iron, sharpening iron, and that hearts, minds, ears would be open to receive it, search the scriptures daily, whether these things are so, and that they would ultimately put their trust in you, Lord, and not in men. Amen. Pray this all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you.